In this lecture, we are going to cover actinobacteria. That will include a discussion of the different genera of actinobacteria, a description of cor corinibacterium, a description of mycobacterium, and lastly, a discussion of the implications of drug resistance in tuberculosis. Streptomyces is a strain of actinobacteria that's been very helpful as far as its contribution to the development of antibiotics, antifungals, and anti-cancer agents. So you might have heard of streptomycin or tetracycline or neomycin. These are all antibiotics that were derived from uh, streptomyces. However, the bacteria, it can still become pathogenic to humans as most opportunistic bacteria are. But the study and the use of streptomyces has been uh, really important in the development of uh, treatments. Actinobacteria are a group of bacteria that are gram positive and they have a high G and C, guanine and cytosine, ratio. They are common uh, in soil and they are also crucial to the carbon cycle in nature. Again, these are some of our composters. Um, and they play a significant role in decomposition of organic materials. They're also commensals in relationship to the human and make up part of its microbiome. It also plays a significant role um, in um, the development of antibiotics and antifungals, as I mentioned prior. And while most of them um, you know, don't impact humans at all, there are a handful that do, and they're significantly pathogenic. Actinomyces are gram-positive microaerophilic to facultative anaerobic bacteria, and they do not form a spore. They are commensals in the mouth, nose, and throat of animals and of us humans, and they uh, you can see from this image here that they kind of grow these long filaments that give them a, a sort of dust bunny appearance. And so because of this, they're often misidentified as a type of fungi because they appear uh, this uh, to look filamentous under the microscope. They uh, can cause um, abscesses, uh, particularly after dental procedures, because they colonate in the aerodigestive tract. Um, and they've also been associated with infections in the face and neck. And then in some rare cases, the chest, the abdomen, pelvis, uh, or the brain. Actinomycosis is a bacterial infection and not a fungal infection. And again, that stems from um, its appearance under the microscope and its mistaken identity as a type of fungi. In 1877, Actinomyces bovis was identified as causing lumpy jaw, quote unquote, uh, syndrome in cattle. And this, uh, manifested itself as a destruction of the bones, the jaw bones of the cattle and the adjacent soft tissues. In humans, uh, it commonly appears in the face and neck as chronic swelling, suppuration, and the formation of abscesses in the sinus, in the sinus tracts. And uh, it's commonly seen again in immunocompromised patients but it is not transmissible from human to human. If it does get into the lungs or some other adjacent tissues, um, oftentimes they will take a biopsy and then this will help them to diagnose it and then treat with antibiotics. Now the corny bacterium species is a non-spore forming gram-positive bacteria. 
It is in the shape of a V. If you can see this image here, they're kind of club shaped or V shaped and uh, they're non-motile catalase positive and they're divided into two major groups, corny bacterium diphtheriae and the non-diphtherial species. They are normally found on our skin, in our GI tracts, and in our upper respiratory tract. Um, but a number of the species of corny bacterium have been identified um, that cause disease are opportunistic pathogens. Corny bacterium diphtheriae is a pleomorphic bacillus and it can be identified um, by its observable granules, but that can't definitively determine if it is the C. diphtheriae. So something else they use to, do, to identify it is it's, a, um, it's kind of herky-jerky motion that it makes right after the cells divide, and then they arrange themselves into these uh, patterns that resemble Chinese letters, and you can see them here in this kind of weird pattern. There are three different strains of the um, C. diphtheriae, and that's Gravis, Intermedius, and Midas, with Gravis being the most virulent strain. It has a generation time of 60 minutes, as opposed to Midas, which is the least virulent, of 180 minutes. Um, it's also its virulence also depends on the quantity and rate of toxin that it produces. And um, it's been studied for a really long time. Since the fourth century, Hippocrates has uh, started studying the C. diphtheriae. And um, because of this, um, you know, we know uh, a lot about uh, medical microbiology and the understanding of these toxins that bacteria secrete. There are two types of diphtheria that affect humans, respiratory and cutaneous. And uh, the respiratory one is transmitted mainly through droplets from coughs and sneezes and the cutaneous one is transmitted through direct contact. Um, as far as the cutaneous one, um, it does get, it, once it gains access into the subcutaneous tissue, uh, if the skin has been compromised, it takes the opportunity um, and it first develops a papule, then that can progress to an ulcer like you see here in this image. Um, how do we prevent it? Don't come into contact with surfaces uh, where there is uh, the diphtheria bacteria. Uh, respiratory diphtheria is um, characterized by where it develops or where, what area is most affected. So uh, either anterior nasal, pharyngeal and tonsillar or laryngeal. And again, it produces toxins and that causes fever, sore throat, weakness, swollen lymph nodes. It also causes this pseudomembrane to develop in the respiratory tract, making it difficult to breathe. The toxin is actually introduced by lysogenic bacteriophages. So how do we treat this? Um, well, we want to treat it as soon as possible with a diphtheria antitoxin and antibiotics. And then we want to provide respiratory support and isolate the patient so that we don't um, spread the transmission of it because it is droplet precautions. Um, it lasts approximately one week to 10 days. And as patients are recovering, they will begin to cough up that pseudomembrane and spit it out. Um, Complications that can occur with it are airway obstruction, respiratory failure, pneumonia, myocarditis, um, coma, and uh, potentially death. 10% of patients that um, receive the treatment that they need die, 50% on average die if they receive no treatment at all. And uh, there have been some outbreaks of diphtheria. However, there was a vaccination 
uh, that we started to use in the United States in the 1920s, but in Russia there is a pretty serious outbreak um, between uh, 1989 and 1994. Uh, again, this is delivered in the Tdap vaccination, which is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and they suggest a 10-year booster with the Tdap. The unique structure of the cell wall of the mycobacterium species is what separates it apart from other um, prokaryotes. And the difference is, is that the cell wall has a high quantity of lipids, and this includes waxes as well. And this is the reason that they are classified as gram variable. Um, they don't consistently stain red or blue. And to identify them correctly, we need to use an acid fast stain. Now, organisms are straight or slightly curved, typically. They're non-motile and they do not form spores. The, the genus includes saprophytes, obligate parasites, um, and some other types that vary in nutritional requirements. They are aerobic and they are found in the soil and in warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals such as us, turtles, fish, snakes, and froggies. Um, there are some species that are indigenous to us. There are also opportunistic pathogens and then true pathogens to humans. And typically the skin and respiratory systems are those that are infected the most. Uh, again, our immunocompromised individuals are going to be at the highest risk of infection, and this species causes diseases such as leprosy, tuberculosis, non and other non-TB respiratory infections. And uh, if they suspect that there's an infection by mycobacterium, they're going to obtain a culture either from lesions, lymph nodes, eyes, and or the lung. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an obligate aerobe, which might explain why it loves to infect the upper lobes of the lungs where there is a high oxygen uh, content there. Um, it is very slow growing, um, which is good from a disease perspective, but not as good from a diagnostic perspective whereas it can take a really time to grow it out in the lab uh, and to give us a diagnosis. It was identified by Robert Koch in 1882, and then subsequently he developed the tuberculin, which led to the TB test that we use today. Uh, tuberculosis is the leading killer among infectious diseases. In, nine, uh, in 2013, there were 9 million active cases and 1.5 million deaths. 9,582 of those cases were reported in the United States. Um, since the uh, development of the antibiotic streptomycin, the cases in the United States dropped significantly. However, due to multi-drug resistant strains, the number of cases is on the rise again for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a highly contagious disease and it's spread by droplets. And uh, so when somebody talks, coughs, or sneezes, somebody else can potentially breathe that in, and then it begins to colonize in the respiratory tract to the bronchioles and the upper parts of the lungs. Um, individuals that are uh, diagnosed with tuberculosis are typically put on isolation precautions in a room that has negative pressure. So when the door opens, air will be pulled into the room so that the uh, TB can be contained and will not be transmitted throughout the hospital through the rest of the facility. There are two different types of TB. There are latent TB infection and TB disease. And the individuals with latent uh, 
Uh, the latent type show no signs or symptoms. They're not contagious to others. However, if they do become immunocompromised, then they could convert to the TB disease. Individuals that have the TB disease are contagious and they have symptoms such as fever, chills, sweating, loss of appetite, weight loss, weakness, fatigue, and severe cough and that cough could also produce bloody sputum. As far as the progression of the disease, TB follows two paths. One is primary tuberculosis and the other is reinfection. So primary tuberculosis uh, is followed by acute, an acute exudative stage that rapidly spreads uh, via the lymphatic system. Now these lesions typically heal with some scarring, but they leave something called a tubercle. And uh, reinfection is the chronic form of TB, and it's characterized by lesions that secrete an exudative fluid. Reinfection typically starts due to cells that have survived the primary TB. These lesions from the reinfection usually establish themselves in the apex of the lungs, which is, remember, the tops of the lungs. And then the new cells have a tendency to colonize in the lower lobes of the lungs. So once a person breathes in the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, it's going to travel through the respiratory system. Again, it's going to begin to colonize and establish itself in the bronchioles and the alveoli, and it's going to meet very little resistance from the host. And it's going to be fairly protected from those macrophages that are going to come to try to engulf it. And, um, then lesions are going to start to develop and there's two types of lesions there's exudative um, or productive exudative lesions are caused by an inflammatory response from the host and the lesions contain liquid exudate and that's composed of monocytes and neutrophils and this continues, as it continues to progress, there's necrosis of the lung tissue that heals, and that healing causes this small round little nodule that they refer to as a tubercle. Productive lesions, on the other hand, do not have exudate, but they're like a clump of cells that form around the bacilli, and this uh, it eventually uh, turns into something called a granuloma. And uh, that can also be referred to as a gun complex. And these gun complexes can survive for many years uh, or they could eventually die. Um, the collection of specimens is very important in the diagnostic process. And uh, so some specimens they might collect are sputum, bronchial washings, lung tissue samples, urine, cerebral spinal fluid, and bone marrow. Because mycobacterium tuberculosis induces a hypersensitivity reaction, the skin test is effective because it uses a protein antigen from the filtrate of tubercle bacillus cultures. And so uh, if an individual has either been exposed, has the disease, or has been vaccinated, then they're going to have a positive result. And it's going to show as a raised reddened area around the injection site. Now, typically, after the um, TB test is given, uh, it needs to be read within 48 to 72 hours. And the most accurate type of skin test is the Manto test. And this is where they're going to give an intradermal injection of that antigen purified protein derivative or PPD. So that's why sometimes you might hear it called the TB test or you might hear it called PPD test. Um, if someone has never been infected, then it's going to be negative or it's too soon to tell kind of thing. Um, the, there is a vaccine. However, um, and that was developed in 1921, but it is not very effective. Um, it only provides partial protection from TB. They really don't know how long it lasts. 
So it's not really considered that reliable. Um, and then in 1934 was when the, um, the PPD was developed. Now there are some issues with drug resistant strains of TB and um, it's typically because of misuse or mismanagement of drug treatment. And uh, drug resistance is most likely to occur, occur in individuals that don't take their medication uh, regularly or who don't complete the course of treatment and or they get TB again after being treated previously. Could also be that they come from a region where drug resistant TB is common. Uh, the uh, three countries where TB is uh, the multi-drug resistant TB is the most common is India, China, and Russia. And uh, costs for extensive drug resistant TB could be as much as a half a million dollars. And in 2013, 65% of all tuberculosis cases and 90% of multi-drug resistant TB cases in the United States occurred among people who were born in other countries. Mycobacterium leprae is a slow growing bacteria with a waxy cell wall very similar to Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It grows best at temperatures that are slightly below body temperature and that could explain why it infects areas like the fingers, toes, ears, and nose region. This is the bacteria that causes leprosy. And uh, another name for it is Hansen's disease, which was named after the guy who discovered it. Way back when, even in biblical times, leprosy is discussed um, as a very feared, very highly contagious disease. And these people were um, often isolated from the general population. It can affect both the skin and the peripheral nervous system. And as a result, um, it presents with disfiguring skin rashes and loss of cutaneous sensation or skin sensation. Uh, it is highly communicable through direct person-to-person -person contact or uh, contact with nasal secretions in droplets similar to tuberculosis. There are two different forms, tuberculoid and lepromatosis, and it takes quite a while for symptoms to manifest themselves. Um, if it goes untreated, then the infection is going to progress to either tuberculoid or lepromatosis form, and scientists aren't sure why this happens. They think it might be uh, due to some sort of uh, genetic structure that determines which type of leprosy will develop. In individuals that have the tuberculoid form, scientists think that it's due to a very strong response from the immune system, uh, but will still result in loss of nerve sensation. Patients whose immune systems are not able to fight off the infection will experience progression of the disease into lepromatosis. And uh, this is when the disease is most contagious and uh, there will be the appearance of lesions on the skin. They occur throughout the body and it can lead to gross disfigurement because the bacteria will erode the bones and the cartilage. And you can often, uh, in this stage, individuals have an appearance of a lion-like face. And uh, this is because that cartilage of the nose gets destroyed and so it will flatten and collapse. The toes and fingers may also have to be amputated due to the extensive bone and cartilage damage. Cases have been trending downward. In 2012, there was a reported 232,000-ish. And then in 2013, 
um, down to 189,000. Um, it's not very common in the United States, but there have been cases identified in California, Hawaii, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, New York, and Puerto Rico. Um, of the 6,500 cases, 90% of those were those of immigrants into the United States. Now, Louisiana does have a clinic, uh, actually a treatment center and six other satellite centers where they will treat individuals with leprosy at no cost. Nocardia is a species of bacteria that are classified as aerobic saprophytes. So again, these are our composters. They live in the soil and they feed on dead or decaying organic matter. They can also be found in fresh or salt water. Of the approximately 50 species of nocardia, um, there are a small handful that are um, infectious to humans. And those are of the Nocardia asteroides complex, and that includes Asteroides, Abscessus, Syrisa georgica, Varsinica, Nova. And then there's also a Nocardia transvalensis complex, and a uh, Brasiliensis and a pseudo Brasiliensis. So those are the ones we're most concerned about. They're kind of difficult to uh, classify uh, at times because of their fungus-like appearance. Nocardiosis is a relatively uncommon um, gram-positive bacterial infection. There are about 500 to 1,000 cases reported annually in the United States. And this type of bacteria localizes or can become systemic and it causes pus to form in both humans and animals. It is transmitted via inhalation of dust where the bacteria lives or if you have an open wound on your skin and it gets contaminated with soil that has the bacteria in it, uh, that could also lead to an infection. It's regarded as opportunistic. However, um, one third of infected patients have no immune deficiency whatsoever. It has a, a an incredible ability to spread to almost any organ and it has an affinity for the central nervous system. 80% of these cases present as invasive pulmonary infections, disseminated infections or brain abscesses, and 20% present as cellulitis. It can also involve the kidneys, joints, heart, eyes, and bones and commonly presents as far as pulmonary infections with fever, cough, and or discomfort in the chest. It can also, uh, if it is uh, impacting the central nervous system, can lead to headaches, lethargy, confusion, seizures, uh, or onset of neurological deficit. In some very rare cases, it can infect the skin and the skeletal muscle and you can see that here in this upper image uh, on the slide. Those that are immunocompromised are at greatest risk for this cutaneous type of nocardiosis. We're coming into the home stretch here just with a brief discussion of streptomyces. Streptomyces is a class of actinobacteria that is non-motile and it grows these little filaments and it's gram positive and it uh, produces spores from these little filaments and those are called sporophores. Similar to other uh, actinobacteria, they were long thought to be fungi due to their method of reproduction and growth. 
They are found in the soil all over the world and are really important in soil ecology. If you can recall the smell of wet dirt when it rains, that smell that you're smelling is a chemical uh, that Streptomyces produces called geosmins. And these bacteria can consume almost anything for food, uh, be it sugars, alcohols, amino acids, or organic acids. And because of this, they have garnered the, the attention of ecologists as far as use in bioremediation. They can cause uh, severe invasive infections, but that is really rare. They um, are best known for their ability to produce antimicrobial substances. And because of this, um, there have been more than 50 different antibiotics, antifungals, and antiparasitics that have come from the Streptomyces species. And some of those you may have heard of, streptomycin, neomycin, tetracyclines, just to name a few. Now, um, as far as uh, infectious type diseases associated with streptomyces, um, one type of infection is common, is uh, one that causes mycetoma which is a chronic localized uh, cutaneous infection that is characterized by um, pus. And it typically results from the transmission of the microorganism through a thorn puncture and typically involves the legs or the feet. Now invasive infections are even more rare and uh, there's been about 10 cases of invasive streptomyces infection between the years 1966 and 2000. And these were predominantly in patients that had HIV AIDS. That is going to wrap up our discussion about actinobacteria. I hope that you found it helpful and somewhat interesting and uh, applicable to um, the role of the surge tech.